Okay, yeah, good morning everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this uh, third day of the workshop. I'm sure it's been a great success. I was chatting with Shazia a little bit and seeing all these uh, posters, so um, I'm, I'm sorry that I had to miss the, uh, the first two days, but I hope to get to meet uh, a lot of you today. Um, so today, is sort of the, my, my task is to talk a little bit about ups and downs, promises, pitfalls, and you know, advantages, perhaps disadvantages of doing a PhD. And when uh, Shazi asked me to do this, uh, I was asked to talk about myself and my experience. And, um, and sort of I thought about it, okay, what can I talk about myself? Well, everybody has a story. But I figured instead of talking about myself, I'm actually going to, um, even though we have another PhD student here, but I figured it's a lot more inspiring for me to talk about my very first PhD student here at, at UQ. I want to be talking about Yang, Yang Liu. Uh, his, his story is by far more uh, inspiring than, than my own. So um, it was two th late 2017, or uh, right about then. I had just joined UQ maybe a couple months prior to that. Um, and, you know, I got a knock on my door, and Yang came to my office, and he said, um, you know, uh, I, I want to do something to do with machine learning. And I heard that you, you do machine learning. He had no idea what machine learning was. He just heard the terminology, and someone appointed him to me. So he came to me and said, I want to do a PhD student. I want to be a PhD student. And I said, all right, so um, what have you done? And he said, you know, I've done finance and I've done this and that. And I'm like, okay, uh, you know, send me your transcripts. And I look at the transcripts, like horrendous marks, all over the place, very bad. The, the courses are not relevant at all to the topic he was going to look into, you know, the courses. It's just a complete mismatch to what he wanted to do. And I said, all right, let me just at least get a sense of what he knows at least a little bit. And uh, in the context of, you know, um, linear algebra, uh, what I wrote on board is equivalent of arithmetic of 124 divided by 2. It's as simple as that, but in the context of linear algebra involving matrices and vectors. But, but the basic uh, thing you need to know if you want to do anything in that domain. And I was expecting him to be able to answer that. And what he did instead was that equivalent of this. He actually he canceled the twos and gave me a completely silly answer. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm in deep trouble with this guy because, uh, you know, he, he's going to probably be a, more of a hand-holding burden for me. And, but one thing that he had, and it was super obvious at the time, was his passion. He just wanted to do something with his life, and he wanted to aim very high, and he wanted to sort of uh, get the PhD done. So we applied, uh, and I said, oh, and, and, and sort of I was also myself a little bit of a late starter. So when I started my PhD, I was also sort of in my mid-20s. And, um, and I figured, OK, you know, he could be like me. The first few years after high school, he just didn't know what he wanted to do. He did, did such and such. So maybe he deserved a second shot, uh, shot the same way that I got. So I said, OK, let's, let's do that. I don't have any PhD students here. I might as well just get started with you. And I said, let's apply. And UQ said, there's no way we're going to let you be a PhD student. But we get you a master, so you know you can get, become a master student. But you got to show that uh, you you can you can sort of become a PhD student before we can transfer you, and you have to pay out of pocket. So his parents, poor parents, were you know paying the twenty thirty thousand dollar tuition, and we said okay, let's get started. He said, you know what, I'm going to do this because I want to get to the to the PhD. And in fact, I was the one at the time saying that I don't think this is a good idea because you. You're on the master's, you're paying $30,000 a year. We don't even know if we can transfer after first year to PhD. He's like, no, I'm going to get it done. So we started working together. And, and sort of every, every me, me, meeting, maybe four or five times a week, coming to my office, going through little things, and what, what can I read? What, what's the sort, resources I need to do? And I told him, you know, you can look at this course, or look, look at that book, or look at that paper. And he just kept at it. It was amazing to see this guy, so much passion. And I thought, OK, this is going to drift off. Soon he's going to get tired and, you know, he's going to walk away. And it turned out that the, after the first year, we actually ended up putting a paper together. He's the second author because it, it was already when he started working, a lot of it was already been done. But his contribution was major in the sense that he did a lot of the implementation, a lot of numerical simulations. So we got a second, you know, authorship for him after the first year. And I went to the PhD school, the graduate school and asked them, you know, can we transfer this guy? And they said, oh, there's no way, because his marks are horrible and such and such. I said, OK. But he already showed that 
you know, he's got some drive in him. So after a few back and forth and so on, they said, we, but he's not going to get in a scholarship. I had my dick at the time, and I said, you know what? I trust this guy enough by now that I'm going to put him on my own dick rub. So they said, okay, if you're okay with that, at the end of the day, we're going to accept him. And he got into PhD school, uh, as a PhD pro in the PhD program. And I think that was, that was a moment when he realized that he can, he can sort of do something positive with his life. And ever since that moment, he, um, he sort of became very good at, at stuff that he was doing very slowly. So at the very beginning, all the work that he had done in terms of coding got recognized by people at Stanford. And they put him actually, this is a sort of a scientific computing lab over there. And the Python uh, repository that's pointed is actually pointed to his GitHub uh, repo. So that was like the first moment he realized, okay, you know, I can get it done and people will appreciate what I'm doing. And he kept at it and what was, uh, what really perhaps the main message here is that he, he just his resilience, right? He never gave up and he admitted when he was wrong. He was never upset when I told him, you know, you're doing something wrong, we need to do more, etc. And he kept at it and he managed in perhaps about three years, he managed to put together three papers of first authors if you're not from the field of optimization, the first, the bottom two papers, uh, those are the A-star journals in the field of optimization. Like, those are the canonical papers you go to if you want to publish results like that. D like, there is no better than these journals. And his first author, and believe me, um, I had bare minimum contributions to all of these, right? So the point of all of this, I think that's the last slide, the point of all sort of a 10 minute my talk is that you are going to perhaps at some point feel that, you know, the road ahead is too hard. You probably look at it and say, I'm going to be able to make it to the end, or things are looking difficult or depressing, you know, and maybe I don't have the qualifications or, or the tools to be able to do this. I think just look at the story of someone like, like Yang. You, you, I hope you realize that if he could do it when he did 124 divided by 2 at that level, and he managed to prove things completely non-trivial and you get um, so many um, sort of um, papers out, I'm sure a lot of other people can do, because I'm sure a lot of you are in far better shape than he was when he started his PhD. So um, I just wanted to share you the story of Yang because I, I hope some of you, if, if you're going through challenges, sort of look back at you know, what other people have gone through and everybody made it. And as Shazia said, there is, a, there is a stop at the end of it temporarily, but at least. There is one. Yeah, thank you. Let's see. We can look at this uh, title. I guess you guys mu must be familiar with such titles. We can say uh, this title so, so many times in best centers or websites. And uh, we know when you say this title, you know it's a lie or uh, it's a daydream. Uh, sometimes it could be like five tips to get rich. Uh, but I promise my tips really help. Well, uh, actually, this is the first time I was invite, I invited to share my experience. Indeed, I uh, had expected that someday in the future, someone will ask me to share experience. But I didn't expect that my audience are PhD students and professors who are smarter than me. So uh, actually, I, I expected that my uh, students, my, my, my audience should be undergraduates, so they can look at me like this, with worship. Uh, but uh, considering you are all PhD students, which are smarter than me, so I hope you won't look at me like this after the talk. Well, uh, well first let's see some general tips. Uh, I think, I bet you must be very familiar with these tips, because we can see then many times, actually, I'm doing bad at some of them, so I'm not going to repeat. And uh, Rocky actually has suggested me to suggest me to share some uh, experience about how to justify the novelty of our work. But I think it's too technical and specific, so I just read three tips which help me my, help me a lot in my PhD. So we can say uh, the first one is make your own tools, and the second is keep your research reproducible, and the last one is seek uh, new challenges. And uh, in China, we has uh, has a wizard from Confucius, which is the greatest philosopher in our history, and uh, he once said, "One must first have good tools in order to do a good job." 
So what can we get from making our own tools? I think this is the first step in our PhD student, uh, in our PhD study. And so we can, I, I think, according to my experience, uh, first we can give a deep and comprehensive understanding of our uh, research through building the tool. And uh, once we build the tool, uh, we have a powerful weapon that can facilitate uh, our research. For example, I have a, a algorithm library. So when I use it, I just need to focus on the logic of algorithm and don't need to pay um, attention to other things. So once my idea doesn't work, I can uh, quickly drop it or modify it. Uh, if it works, then I can uh, quickly move on to the next part. And the third way is we can improve our programming and collaboration skills even before we can realize. And finally, once you build your uh, build a very powerful tool and uh, then you can release it, make it open source and other people can use it and then you can get recognized by your research community. And sometimes in the future, I guess it can bring, bring you more opportunities and uh, you can also uh, become influential. Uh, actually, I indeed receive some offers because of my uh, tools. And so how to make our tools? Uh, here I just list, uh, list five procedures and align them with the term in software engineering. And uh, first we need to figure out what tools we need. It depends on your research topic and it depends on what you are going to do. And the second is to learn uh, from existed uh, existing related tools, uh, for example, read other people's code, and uh, finally, uh, then we can develop a prototype. Uh, you know, uh, making the tool is not a one-step process, so we first, uh, we can develop a, to a prototype which uh, has implemented the core uh, modules, then we can perfect it day after that day. This uh, process is known as refactor. We can say it is sort of like uh, the evolution from ape to human. And uh, finally, we also need to keep it up to date because uh, we need to do new research and sometimes we need to add, uh, for example, algorithms into our tools. And these are two of my tools. And the first one has become one of the most popular libraries for recommender systems and it has gained 1,300 stars. As you can see, I uh, spent a, a few years to develop it. And uh, from, I think, I guess I, I, I started it from 2016. And uh, even now, I still contribute to this repository. And we can say at first, uh, I submitted a lot of commits. Then I have a prototype. Then I just need to perfect it day after day. Well, the second tab is uh, PhD is not just a, a list of publications. We need to keep our research reproducible. And we all know there is a culture we, that we really suffer from that is publish or perish. And it is another version of live or die or to be or not to be. And uh, here are some pictures we can say it looks like at every time we are going to perish, right? Once you, when you didn't have paper, you say, I'm glad to perish. But when you have papers and then you say, I didn't have high quality papers, I'm going to perish. But when you have high quality papers, you say, I cannot frequently publish high quality papers. I'm also going to perish. So I think this uh, culture really, uh, I really suffer from this culture. So sometimes I ask myself, is publishing the only goal of PhD? And what's the meaning of our papers to others. Uh, well, I guess when most people, when we are younger and we had dreamed to change the world, but sometimes, at some day when I realized that I cannot become one of the big names on the cover of famous textbooks, I decided to uh, think, uh, to consider being rigorous to my research and making my work reproducible uh, as the most important thing for me. Well, you may wonder when I dis realized I cannot become one of the big names. I think it should be one day I ask myself why I am in UQ, not MIT. So at that day, I realized 
That's, I cannot become the big names. I'm sorry to you, uh, MIT really betters. Uh, and uh, here we can see the picture. Uh, the picture says more than half of researchers uh, feel there is a significant reproducibility crisis. And I guess uh, you, most of you may have uh, such experience that you cannot r reproduce the results presented in other people's paper, and there is low code. And uh, let's see the spectra of uh, about uh, reproducibility. So with publish, publication early, uh, the results cannot be reproducible. And so we need code, code and data, and sometimes the guidance from the authors that we can uh, fully reproduce the results. So uh, make our research reproducible is very important. And there are some benefits of doing reproducible research. At uh, first, it can increase the likelihood as uh, that the paper will be followed. I guess most people want to see our paper getting uh, followed. And the second, we can improve our programming skills because we want to other people can easily understand our uh, code. And uh, also, if you have a work that can be easily uh, reproduced, we can easily extend it for, extend it for future research uh, uh, faster than starting a new work. And finally, I think the most important thing is that as a PhD, as a research, researcher, we should contribute to our research community. If our papers cannot be reproducible, these papers become, they are just papers, they are a waste of woods, you know. And uh, actually, I released all the code of my papers on my GitHub and uh, integrated them into a repository and uh, answered all the questions from other researchers about my paper, also about the other baselines. And as you can see, there are 109 issues, and all the issues have been uh, answered. And sometimes it could be a multi-round Q&A, so we I really need some patience. And uh, uh, finally, I think this is sort of more general, so I, I'm not go, going to spend too much time on it. We all of people like to stay in uh, our comfort zone. Uh, even for PhD, we like to focus on a topic that has been fully explored in order to have more papers to follow. And we also uh, always doing boring incremental work just for more papers. But sometimes we need to jump out of the comfort zone that we can say we are uh, the ma magic or miracle happens. And uh, for my, as for me, I actually, during my PhD, I changed my research topic from social media analysis, which I'm very familiar with, and to self-supervised learning, it is uh, really ex explored in my research area, and also it is, I imagine, uh, field, I guess, Fred know it, you know, must know it, and uh, the, I also try to write different papers. So these papers are what I have uh, written, and particularly, I, I, lead, I, I want to emphasize that uh, for PhD students, a long survey and uh, to organize a tutorial on the conference uh, is very important because do, uh, doing these things can bring us a holistic, holistic view of our research uh, field. So, uh, I think that's what I want to share, and thank you. I wish you all a successful PhD. <laughs>